And now for his keynote uh, speech, uh, the former governor of California, founding honorary chair of R20, Mr. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, thank you very much, Alex, for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much, President Jose Manuel Barroso, for inviting me to speak here today. Thank you also to Vice President Potimata and Raman Valserial for having me here and for the hospitality. I have to say that the last time we met, President Barroso was in Vienna at the R20 conference. And I was so inspired by your extraordinary passionate speech and by your great vision and fantastic leadership. And that's why I'm so excited here today that we announced our partnership between the European Union and R20. And I can't wait to work together with you for a sustainable energy future around the world. And I have to say it's kind of wild to be here today and to talk about this because just last week I had a major shootout in a bar because we were shooting the ending of my movie Sabotage. <laughs> and uh, it's wonderful to be back in the movies again with all kinds of car races and chase scenes and shootouts and dramas and special effects and thrills and all those kind of things. But that's all movie magic. Today I'm talking here about real drama. According to the International Energy Agency, greenhouse gases once again hit a record high in 2012. We pumped more than 31 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. If we do nothing, we are on track for a temperature increase of 3.6 to 5.3 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. And I can tell you that we have seen in California already the changes. There is no more fire season. We have wildfires all year round. When I was governor of the state of California, we had at one point over 2,000 fires. So it's really changing quickly. So this is why we have to do something about it. But this is the bad news. The good news is that we can do something about it. And that's why I'm so excited to speak to all of you here today, to this gathering of mayors. And I can feel the passion in here, the energy and the resolve. But I also can feel the power in this room. Each of you has an enormous opportunity to fight climate change. Each of you can contribute to lead the world towards a sustainable energy future. And I'm sure that you all have heard from environmentalists over this last decade or so that the only way we can get there to this sustainable energy future is by having this international agreement, a Kyoto 2. But today, I want you to think different. If you own an iPod or an iPhone, you know that Apple's motto is, think different. With that motto, as the inspiration chief Steve Jobs and Apple changed the world. Our global climate change movement needs to steal Apple's motto. If we are willing to think different, we will also change the world. As you know, I always have thought differently. I think that was the secret to my success. If I wouldn't have thought differently, I maybe would still be in Austria yodeling up there in the Alps. I wouldn't be standing here today and talking to you. I remember when I wanted to be a bodybuilding champion, they said, you're in Austria, you can only be a ski champion. It's impossible, that's an American sport. But I thought differently. And people said an enormous man like me with an accent and with a long name like Schwarzenschnitzel or whatever it is, uh, they thought you would never become a movie star. I thought differently. And people said I could never become governor of the state of California because I had no political experience. I thought differently. And then when they said California couldn't have its own environmental laws, because we will have to wait for the federal government, I thought differently. So today I want to share with you Arnold's lessons for thinking differently. There are trailblazers, of course, all over the world who have their own prescriptions for success. But if you don't mind, I would like to share mine. Like Apple, it all started in California. I remember when I ran for governor, I said the first thing I'm going to do is go into office and protect the environment and pump up the economy at the same time. Well, environmentalists were very suspicious. They immediately started, started protesting me wherever I went because they thought that a conservative like me would never be able to protect the environment. Conservatives don't do that. But I thought differently. Uh, I 
believed that the old politics didn't work. Issues were sharply divided along partisan lines, and I rejected that. I realized right away that these divisions are good for the political parties, but they do absolutely nothing for the people. It wasn't easy at first. I remember that people were used to the old way, and they couldn't figure me out. As a matter of fact, some even thought that maybe the Kennedys have infiltrated my mind and that Teddy Kennedy has started to brainwash me or something like that. But to me, it was very simple. There aren't really conservative roads or liberal roads. I think we all drive on the same roads. There isn't conservative air or liberal air. We all breathe the same air. There isn't conservative or liberal water. We all drink the same water. I never believed that you could put people's lives into ideological corners. That's why my first lesson is forget the old politics of division. In fact, put aside politics entirely and only think of solutions, only think of solving the problem and serving the people. We can accomplish much more with a bipartisan approach where we bring all the parties together and then on the end put people above the parties. Let's not forget that politicians are public servants and not party servants. That's how we accomplished everything that we did in California. We put together a great team with the public sector, the private sector, conservatives and liberals, community organizations and universities, environmentalists and business leaders. We all worked together. And because of that, we created a lot of action. From the tailpipe emission reductions to the million solar roof program, to our renewable portfolio standard of making a commitment to have 48% of renewables by the year 2020, to our biggest solar plants that we have been building, to completing the first power line exclusively for renewable energy, to our historic climate change law, AB32, where we made a commitment to reduce our greenhouse gases by 25% by the year 2020 and by 85% by the year 2050. When we passed those laws, some experts thought that we were absolutely crazy. They said it was Washington's job, actually, to do that. The states had absolutely no business of doing that. And I said, the hell with that. At every step of the way, people fought us. When we passed our tailpipe emissions reductions, car companies descended on California and all sued us. And the federal government sided with the car companies and they stopped us claiming that greenhouse gases are not a pollutant. Well, we sued the federal government and the Bush administration, and we went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided with us and said, yes, greenhouse gases are a pollutant. Well, duh. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't take much brain power to figure that one out. I mean, I would have done it a little bit easier, to be honest with you. I wanted to hook up those naysayers to an exhaust pipe of a truck and then turn on the engine, I think they would have figured out very quickly that it is a pollutant. But anyway, that was, would have been my style. The National Journal afterwards wrote, when California enacted a tough clean air rule, reigning in global warming pollution from vehicle tailpipes, the auto industry and its allies in Congress fought hard to have it overturned. Instead, we actually inspired many other states, 14 other states that passed tailpipe emissions rules modeled on California standards. And then we had the great victory because in May of 2009, the Obama administration made it a federal law to follow California's lead. So as you can see, the power of subnational governments. That brings me to my second lesson. The old way was to wait for the capitals or an international agreement to create a sustainable energy future. But believe me, there's a new way in moving forward that is at the subnational level, in addition to the national levels and to the international level, in the states, in the provinces, and in the cities, just like we have done it in California. Because remember what Einstein said, insanity is if you're doing the same thing over and over again but try to have different results. Well, we have to do the same thing with our environmental fight. We have to try different things, not the same things. We can't be paralyzed whether you're waiting on an international agreement or on federal action or anything else, it is time we move full steam ahead. Hope for those things, yes, but don't wait on them. I hope there's an international agreement. 
I hope there's a Kyoto 2 agreement, of course. As you all know, I love sequels. But we can't wait on those things. And I know that if anyone can bring all those uh, nations together, it is generally Secretary Ban Ki-moon, because he's an extraordinary leader and a fantastic visionary. We all are there to help him. But there isn't just one path to a green energy future. There are many roads that take us there. I believe that we must continue to move forward at the sub-national level as well. We should be defined by our movement, not by our hesitation. Remember that the best action, the biggest action, has always started at the grassroots level. If you look at the greatest movements in history, from the movement to end apartheid in South Africa, to the suffrage movement in America that gave women the right to vote, to the independence movement in India, to the civil rights movement in the U.S., all of those movements started at the grassroots level. None of them started at any capital, no matter what. So the same thing is true also with our environmental movement. Our green movement has examples, of course, of great subnational government action all over the world already. Now, I always like to brag about California because I was the governor of California and because we really created great action, but I also wear a second hat, which is to be the founder of the R20, which is an international organization, so this is why I like to also brag about all kinds of international action. And one place I like to talk about is Gussing in Austria, where they had a great green revolution. In 20 years, they went from being unable to pay for the energy costs to producing all of their own renewable energy. So this was because of the great leadership of Mayor Vadaj, who is a good friend of mine, and he was an extraordinary leader. Now the state of Burgenland, where Gussing is located, has followed their lead. It started in this little city with a visionary mayor, and now this little city has inspired the whole state, and that whole state will inspire the whole country. Each of you has the power to be another Mayor Vadaj. Each of you can be visionaries who think differently. And each of you can inspire action that extends far beyond our, uh, your cities. If you talk about action all over the world, I mean, look at Delhi, India. We place their polluting taxis and buses with clean burning natural vehicles, which emit now 50% less. Or Los Angeles has the second biggest streetlight system in the world, and by replacing their streetlights with LEDs, are saving now 63% of cost and also on energy, and therefore have a huge reduction on CO2. And all over the European Union, there are cities that are in local governments that are moving forward in a very aggressive way. My friend, Mayor Boris Johnson in London, in London who started the bicycles to make people drive the less cars. It's a very successful program, and everyone is copying it all over the world. Oslo led the way to efficient streetlights to save 70% of their energy. And now they also generate 50% of their energy by using garbage and waste, which isn't really waste anymore now because they can use it for something. And Copenhagen sent an ambitious goal to be carbon-free by the year 2025. I love that kind of action. I could go on all day with this kind of action. It is simple math. If you know that you need to get 100%, you can get it two ways. One is in one shot or in pieces, fragmented pieces. To give you a better idea of what I'm talking about, let me talk a little bit about weightlifting. For me, everything comes back to sports because that's where I learned most of my lessons. In the beginning of weightlifting, there were only giant barbells. You know, that bar with the bells on the side, with these round balls that were welded on it. And those things couldn't be changed at all. The weight could not be adjusted. Sometimes those barbells weighed up to 250 pounds, so only someone that was very powerful could lift it. And if you couldn't lift it, you would walk away defeated, feeling totally terrible. That 250-pound barbell was the old way of doing things. And I think it is a fantastic analogy for an international agreement. If you think that the only way forward is a Kyoto 2, then you may think it is too much to lift and you walk away feeling defeated. Fortunately, in weightlifting, someone thought differently and invented the barbell plates so they could make the weights adjustable so that the person that lifts only 20 pounds can lift it 
person that can only lift 50 pounds can participate. Everyone could participate. And that's why I love subnational governments, because they give us those incremental steps to reach the 100%. They are the small barbell blades that make fighting climate change possible. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a massive weight we must lift, must lift off our world. The international community in the UN alone cannot lift it, but together we can. That's why we launched the R20, our international environmental organization. The R20 is all about action. It brings together regional and national governments and the public and the private sector to create strong economies around the world and to reduce greenhouse gases at the same time. We are already moving forward very aggressively. In all, we have already a portfolio of bankable projects worth more than $1 billion. And today I'm very happy to be here to announce with President Barroso a, a partnership between the European Union and the R20 to create a universal way of measuring and reporting the impacts of subnational solutions. We will be able to show the national governments, the national governments in the UN, how much cities and states are able to contribute. This way we are working from the top down on an international level and also from the bottom up on a subnational level. And eventually the two will meet in the middle and will create critical mass. Which brings me to my third and last lesson. We must communicate better. If we are going to inspire the world, it is time we forget about the old way of talking about climate change. I don't think that any movement ever has been uh, really successful and made any progress based on guilt. There's a new way, a hip way, a cutting edge way, a sexy way. Instead of using doom and gloom and telling people what they can't do, we should make them be part of our movement and tell them what they can do. For instance, I still drive my giant military trucks, the Humvees, but now they're powered on hydrogen and biofuel. And one is being changed right now to an electric Hummer. You see, the technology is now available. Or look at Tesla, for instance, when we talk about electric. Their Model S, which is their luxury sedan, changed the conversation about clean cars completely. In fact, they changed the world. In the first quarter of this year, that model outsold its Mercedes counterpart. It outsold its BMW and auto counterparts combined. When they got started, they had no money, so they got a loan from the federal government of $500 million. They just paid back that loan nine years early. Talk about the power of changing the conversation. We could do exactly the same thing. We need to send a message that you can live the same life just with cleaner technology. We do not have to change our lifestyle. You can still have all of your jacuzzis that you want, just install a solar panel. You can still use your air conditioner, just use a smart thermostat. You still can watch your flat screen TV, just have a more efficient model. You can still drive all your trucks, just have a hydrogen or electric engine there. The technology is now available. Instead of lecturing people that they are part of the problem, we can inspire them and make them part of the solution. That's people power. And let me tell you something, we've seen that people power in California, because we have used the people, they have been our partners in conserving energy and using clean sources of uh, power for years and years. And because of that, California today is 40% more energy efficient than the rest of the United States. As a matter of fact, if the United States would be as energy efficient as California, we could literally reduce 75% of our coal-fired power plants. That's an equivalent of taking 187 million cars off the road. That is people power. We want to inspire the people to discover their power and then flex it. If we communicate well, there is no one that can stop us. I imagine the whole communication actually to be like a strategy that is a, a four-legged stool. A four-legged stool is very stable. A one-legged stool is wobbly. I feel that sometimes we're only commun communicating like with one leg. We only talk about climate change. But what is if someone doesn't really believe in climate change? There's so many arguments that we have. Like, for instance, people care about health care. 
we should talk about health care because more than 100,000 people a year die in the United States because of pollution-related illnesses. And millions of people die all over the world. The next leg ought to be national security. I mean, no one thinks that it's a good idea to rely on some crackpot uh, dictator in the Middle East for some energy. I think we can do better than that and produce our own energy. And the final leg ought to be jobs. I mean, we have proven in California that you can pump up the environment and also pump up the economy at the same time. As a matter of fact, the green sector has produced 10 times more jobs than any other sector. In fact, the Wall Street Journal said that we ushered in a new California gold rush. We attracted more than 60% of the green tech venture capital in the United States, even though California only represents 10% of the United States. So, and we are building one solar plant after the next. So there's all kinds of action there. We need to use all of those arguments. We must use the four-legged stool rather than just talking about the environment. You can see that by communicating differently, we can change the conversation and we can convince people to join our crusade. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel very passionate about this. And I promise you, I will not stop fighting, I will not stop campaigning around the world, and I will not give up until this crusade is successful. To paraphrase George Bernard Shaw, some people see things and ask why. I dream of things that don't exist yet and ask why not. So thank you very much for your attention, thank you for your hospitality, and thank you for your great leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Arnold Schwarzenegger.